think it's a fair, again, a fair to question your motives because the fact is we know that research, um, scientists are not robots. The researchers, you know, there are personal agendas or belief systems that are driving whether consciously or unconsciously. And uh, we can find, I, we can find such a wide range, and I'm going to move off of homosexuality in a second, but we can find such a wide range of people identifying, you know, in different ways depending on how you ask the question. If you ask in your whole lifetime, have you ever had a same-sex experience? In the last year, right, since 18, since 13, the way you frame it will provide vastly different numbers within a limited range, of course. Right. Notwithstanding Kinsey's 37, most numbers, you know, most will be 2, 4 percent, maybe, get to 6 to 10. I've seen one study, I think it was 11 percent, depending on how they frame the questioning, right? So I, I always, as a critical thinker, question why would someone frame the questions in a certain way, right? So, again, that's why I'm thinking it's fair, fair game to ask you about your own motives in this kind of research, right? Yeah, I, and I, I think that uh, it's it's a good point you have there. Uh, and, yeah, I do, I do think there's a correlation between uh, politics and whether one wants these numbers high or low. That, you know, that, and there's indisputably that correlation it doesn't make any sense because if homosexuality uh is as i think fine <laughs> then it shouldn't matter if the rate of homosexuality is 40 percent or 0.0001 percent uh it's fine you know it, it, it's it's harmless to people and so on and uh, and it, if I'm wrong, if it's some grave evil, then it also doesn't matter how common it is. So it, it, it's one of those debates that I never had much patience with in that context. Right. Now, the other controversy, I think it's less known. I, I don't know. I'm not sure in your life how much it came back to you. But you wrote a very interesting article with Aaron Greenberg, Parental Selection of Children's Sexual Orientation, in 2001, where you opined about the morality of selecting for heterosexuality. And what was the motive and what was the backlash from the paper? My earliest notable research was uh, on twins and sexual orientation related to genetics. And I found evidence that uh, genes are relevant to both male and female sexual orientation. And the initial reactions to that, which I found very uh, satisfying, were that like, pro-gay people loved it, the anti-gay people hated it. I would get hate mail back in the day from social conservatives, uh, and, you know, that, that uh, made me feel good. You know, I was making the right people happy and the, the right people unhappy. But... Before long, uh, there was a subgroup of pro-gay people who were saying this work is dangerous because, you know, we keep finding, you know, for instance, why are you, why do you care about causes of sexual orientation? And, you know, if, if we find the causes, then people are going to use that information to get rid of homosexuality. A lot of people were thinking about this, and, you know, uh, there was even a, a play called Twilight of the Golds that right. had this premise. Uh, so uh, my uh, friend uh, and co-author of this paper, Aaron Greenberg, uh, and I, we were talking about, you know, like it seemed at least early on that it, it would be really bad if people, you know, if we discovered a gene and people use this to... Uh, selectively abort gay fetuses and so on. But, you know, the more we talked about it, we noticed hypocrisy where, you know, people, they would consistently say uh, a woman has a right to choose abortion or not, no matter what, you know, she can choose. It's, you know, whatever reason, you know, if she doesn't feel like having a baby, she should not be forced to carry a baby to term. Some of these same people were in this context, talking about murdering gay babies, <laughs> you know, and it just, it just seemed so inconsistent. So Aaron, uh, mainly, but in conversation with me, did, a, I think, a very complete and cogent analysis in which we, uh, again, main, mainly him, but uh, argued that, um, first of all, there's no good reason to dislike gay people. We don't like dislike gay people. We think, 
Gay people are just as good as straight people. And two, nobody should harm existing people. No murder, okay? No murder allowed. So given that, what's the ethics of parents influencing their kids' sexual orientation? Let me just stipulate, nobody knows how to do this. And uh, by trying to, to manipulate kids' sexual orientation right now, parents are, are causing harm because they're putting their kids in therapy that doesn't work and makes the kids feel terrible. So this is science fiction. Imagine you could imagine there was a pill that parents could give their one-year-old little boys that would guarantee them becoming heterosexual adults. Would that be an awful thing? And, and we concluded, uh, no, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be bad. As long as parents aren't harming actual people, uh, we should step back and let parents uh, do what they want in this domain. Since I didn't uh, mainly write this paper, I'm not being uh, immodest by saying there are brilliant arguments in this paper, and I strongly recommend anybody who is feeling either interested or infuriated to uh, to look at it. So you, you asked about the ramifications of this paper. Yeah, this yeah. paper is one of my undersighted papers. You know, it's barely been cited. Uh, it has gotten a lot of attention, and a lot of that attention has been from people who dislike me otherwise <laughs> and want to spread it because they think that it will make people mad. And uh, it, it has to some extent. We did uh, present this paper in uh, a scientific meeting, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association meeting, and it got some national press and, you know, it, some of the attendees were uh, extremely upset. I will say they didn't have very good arguments against it. Then the paper, you know, just kind of left public attention until my book controversy in which uh, some people who tried to do me harm brought it back up. And, you know, I, I'm not ashamed of the paper. I'm happy to discuss and this it. Is, by the way, when I say this to the students, I present this exactly. summary of the point, and I want them to talk about it as well and say, okay, you know what? If you are going to say that it's okay to abort babies, whether it's for medical reasons or, as you say, yeah. it's a woman's body, her choice, so for any reason whatsoever, you know, like, why not this reason kind of thing, if you're using that same approach, right, like the same, the same logical thinking. So... I put it out there to the students, and it really, I think it's so, I, I see students' eyes, it's kind of like, you know, really sparkle and try to figure this out. Um, you know, others just react just emotionally without even thinking about the logic of the argument. But I, I, to just, I just want to say, I wish I had had a teacher like you in college. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, again, it's all about critical thinking. Here's the one sentence where I, I say, okay, I can't figure this one out here. Uh, here's this one of the concluding statements in the paper, okay? Uh, parents making such selections may well be doing so out of good or at least neutral motives. What would be a good or a neutral motive for you know, aborting a baby? One thing that we do in this paper that you're kind of, maybe you don't remember, but you're not heeding to the spirit of the paper, is that we uh, stipulated that if you have a problem with abortion, then let's not talk about abortion. Let's talk about some other means affecting the kid's sexual orientation, like taking a pill, or we had the uh, argument, maybe, uh, let's suppose that uh, you can ensure that a child will be heterosexual by not eating shrimp during the second trimester right. of pregnancy. Yep. So would that be an evil thing to do, right. to not eat shrimp during the second trimester of pregnancy? So let's say a parent did choose not to eat shrimp in the second trimester trimester of pregnancy because they preferred to have a heterosexual child. What would be a, a not immoral motivation for that preference? Well, we, we uh, raised two in the article that we don't see as clearly immoral. One of them uh, is a preference for grandchildren, which uh, is going to correlate with a heterosexual outcome. Now, of course, Gay people are having more and more kids. Nevertheless, the chances are lower. And uh, the other is the preference for having a child that is likely to have more similar experiences to the parents 
I think that parents uh, delight in having children kind of go through the same life path that they did. And that doesn't mean that they hate gay people. It just means I can't wait for them to get married and have kids and so on. And again, I know some gay people do, and that's great. That's fine. They did it less back when we were writing that. And I also think that, uh, you know, realistically, uh, straight people and gay people lead somewhat different lives, and even today. And uh, parents might have the preference to have kids that are more like them, you know, in that way. And I remember those arguments. And the thing was, I think that what I was hung up on, and I'm glad that you've, you've kind of confirmed or explained, it was the word neutral. And I now, just there's context. So the next sentence, you say, even when the selection is made out of the worst motive, parental heterosexism. You're, you're saying neutral is something that's not heterosexism, basically. Right. So a parent who said, who says, you know, I just don't like gay people, or I think that it's wrong to be gay. We don't like that motive. Uh, we think that people with such motives are, in that respect, bad people. They might be good other ways. But even then, does it make sense to make those kids have gay babies? <laughs> You know, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not good for anybody. So that that's where we said, even when it's in the worst uh, motive, uh, we uh, favor their uh, ability to choose to the extent that it's possible. So, that's, I think, so now you've clarified that. It was ethically neutral in the last section that you were saying it. There we go. If I hadn't asked you that, I wouldn't have known. So I thought that was a bit of an inconsistency, but now I get it. I, I do believe this paper is available. I think people can Google it if they want to read the article, because again, it really gets you thinking. People would say, if he's not actually trying to subtly say that, you know, notwithstanding all of his protestations to the, uh, to the contrary, where he's saying, no, no, we like gays, gays, homosexuality is fine, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Despite all that, in the end, he's still trying to say, abort gay babies. Okay, we have to go with the eugenics here. So people would say, if he's not doing that, why the hell would he even raise this in the first place? Now you kind of you spoke to that at the beginning when you talked about that that the, you know this idea that if there are any genetic markers, that would be a possible consequence of that. That people would say, okay, well, if there are genetic markers, fine, I want to abort, right? And that was kind of the motive for this. But that's a very practical, potentially practical question. You know, like uh, we have this this technology, how do we use it? Was there also, in your mind, though, just kind of like a philosophical type of question, like, you know, just this moral question of, like, you know, why is it okay to abort for these reasons, but not for that reason? My two reasons were, first of all, because people were making noises about stopping that kind of research, and that made me wonder, did, would, would their reasons be good? And we concluded no. And the other is, uh, you know, there was a lot of sound and fury, and... When we thought about their arguments, they were poor arguments. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it is important to me that people think clearly. And, uh, you know, as far as my motivations and why I keep getting involved in controversies, I don't enjoy controversies where people are angry at me and trying to get me fired. It's not fun. Uh, but... Um, where I am, I am drawn to controversy. Controversy means that it's important and that we don't know things. So if I feel like I know things, either through science or through reasoning, and uh, a, a lot of people are saying incorrect things, and especially if they're ethically smug, uh, that just provokes me. That's where I go. I think she was saying that you're more, I don't know if she used this word, I don't think it's in the DSM, but uh, shit disturber, okay? I think she, she used another word similar to that. So. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a shit disturber, though, you know, I try to pick my spots and not, not always successful. I don't shy away from things that uh, I know are going to cause trouble if I think that I'm right, and the world will be better off with people knowing the correct things. So it's not disturbing shit for the sake of disturbing shit, but rather than if you think that there's something that needs to be said, something needs to be addressed, you're willing to risk the repercussions of stirring that shit. Would that be a fair uh, way to portray it? Yes. I believe that's true, and 
you know, I do my best. Sometimes it's, you know, a little less clear. <laughs> These days, there's probably a lot more that I don't say and feel bad kind of about not saying than I, that I do, uh, but not in the topics that we're, we're discussing today.